Let's pray together. Our Heavenly Father, we first of all thank you. Thank you, Father. You're so good to all of us. And we don't have the words to express to you, but you know our hearts. We now intercede for every request that's been called out. We pray for Tim's salvation, that someone can go by and witness to him, and he'll receive the gospel. We pray for all the others that's been mentioned. We pray for Taylor today. And Lord, all your people need to have the word, a church setting, not to be counted, not just to show up, but Lord, to express what you have for us on a regular basis from heaven. We pray, dear God, for Israel today, and we pray for the peace of Jerusalem, and we pray, God, for this country, and we pray, God, for this church. We pray for this week's play practices, the play weekend, and dear God, we ask even today in this church, we'll experience your anointing. Bless this, bless this time of Bible study. All the praise is yours in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Mark, the 15th chapter. Today our lesson is entitled, The Servant's Sacrifice. Our first part we want to relate to is the events preceding the crucifixion. Before the crucifixion. Some things that took place before the crucifixion. Our first part, our charges are finalized. Mark 15, verse 1. Let's see how they would finalize these charges. And straightway, straightway means at once. In the morning, the chief priests held a consultation or deliberation with the elders and scribes and the whole council. This is the Sanhedrin now. 70 men plus the high priest. And they bound Jesus, carried him away, and delivered him to Pilate. So they got the charges together. They're in total agreement from the Sanhedrin down to the elders, the scribes, the chief priests, have liberated. And they turn him over now to Pilate. Now Pilate asks a question in verse 2. Let me give some assignments, please. Uh, Brother Marty, Isaiah 53, verse 7. Brother Alton, Psalm 22, verse 14 through 19. Brother Wendell? No, not me, Okay. Miss Rosemary, can you do it without your voice? Psalm 22, 17 and 18. Just hold those. Let's look at the question asked by Pilate in verse 2. And Pilate asked him, Art thou the king of the Jews? And he answered and said unto him, Thou sayest it. This is one thing that bothered the leadership at that time of Rome, is hearing, him, hearing people talk about the king of the Jews. And they were jealous. And they were, they were called concerned. Is someone trying to be king besides us in leadership? So the question he asks is a natural question. It's not a spiritual question. It's a natural question. Uh, are you the king of the Jews? And he answered and said, Thou sayest it. In other words, you got it right. But he did not come back and uh, del deliberate about the question. He didn't try to explain about what's going on about why he's here. He just said, he just said, Three words, thy sayest it. Now, Brother Marty, will you please read Isaiah 53, verse 7? He says, uh, He was oppressed and was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before her shears is dumb. So he opened not his mouth. So twice in that verse, he opened not his mouth. We'll notice as we study, oh, uh, the Gospels about the crucifixion and what took place before the crucifixion is that he didn't say much. He didn't say much. He didn't say many words. And Isaiah 53 verse 7 prophesied that. Twice in one verse, he opened not his mouth. 
but as a sheep, dumb, not speaking anything before the slaughter. Now, Pilate was a governor of Judea, also Felix and Festus. We know from the book of Acts that Paul stood before Felix and Festus and also Agrippa. So this leadership uh, they have at that time of Rome are coming to play here before Christ is crucified. Now, Pilate was amazed, look in verse 3 with me, and it says, And the chief priests accused him of many things, but he answered nothing. And Pilate asked him again, saying, Answer thou nothing? Behold, how many things they witness against thee. You got a long list. You're not going to say and think about it? Verse 5. But Jesus answered nothing, so that Pilate marveled. So Pilate marveled because he would not respond to anything. Now, what are your thoughts beside the prophecy given by Isaiah that he would say nothing, open not his mouth twice in one word? What are your thoughts, again, about him just not saying anything? Or can we, can we apply that day to our lives today sometime when we are accused or people come against us or whatever on Facebook? Should we retaliate or be quiet, you think, even more? Be quiet. Be quiet. And give God room to work, right? Mm -hmm. I think retaliation sometimes puts gas on the fire, you know, because people, sometimes you can't, you can't just uh, talk to them about things. When the girl called me from the Axe place downtown, when she called me that afternoon, I began to talk to her, and we was talking pretty good, and I was using the Bible, you know. My, my part was the Bible, and she said, I don't believe the Bible. I said, well, we can't talk no more then. All I got to give you is what I'm using scripture. So you don't believe the Bible, we can't talk. We can't talk too much more. But that's what Christ is doing here. See, the pilots not say, uh, the others are not say. So he can't say much as far as spiritual things because they don't they don't understand the spiritual things he would say to them. So he doesn't say anything. With a long list against him, he says nothing. Now a prisoner whom they would uh, could, could be, be released in verse 6. Let's pick up there. Now, the, at that feast, that's the Passover and unleavened bread, he released unto them one prisoner, whomsoever they desired. So it was up to them to decide who they wanted to release. But look in verse 7. And there was one named Bar Bar Barabbas, Barabbas, which lay bound with, with them that they had made insurrection with him, who had committed a murder. He, he was a murderer in the insurrection. And now we have him in verse number, let's go ahead and read verse number eight. And the multitude cried aloud, began to desire him to be, to do as he had ever done unto them. But Pilate answered them saying, will you that I release unto you the king of the Jews? For he knew that the chief priest had delivered him for envy, Notice what it says for envy. The other words, they they jealous too. And then verse 11, But the chief priest moved the people that he should rather release Barabbas unto them. Now who moved the people? The chief priest. The religious people. <clears throat> moved all the people, encouraged all the people, let's ask that Pilate release Barabbas. He's a murderer. He's involved in insurrection. He, he's, uh, he's, uh, he's, he's guilty, he, he, he's, he's, he's a bad person, but let, let's ask that he release unto us Barabbas and not Jesus. But we know the plan of God was Calvary. He, you know, he, was, he was going to Calvary, so that was God's plan. They might have felt like they were getting their way, but it was God's plan. He, he had to have the crucifixion. We had to have him to die for us. So, uh, Miss Connie, will you please read John 18, 38 through 40? Pilate saith unto him, What is truth? And when he had said this, he went out again unto the Jews, <clears throat> excuse me, and saith unto them, I find in him no fault at all. But ye have a custom that I should release unto you one at the Passover. Will ye therefore that I release unto you the king of the Jews? 
Then cried they all again, saying, Not this man, but Barabbas. Now Barabbas was a robber. So he said, I found no fault in this man. Mm -hmm. Nothing. He had all kind of accusations against Jesus. All kind of lies. These are blasphemer. All this. And he said, I find no fault. And there was no fault in him. <laughs> he never had fault in him. He never sinned. He never made anything as far as mistakes. And that's the verdict that, that Pilate come up with. But again, it's God's plan for Calvary. Even though they found no fault. Matter of fact, they found, if they found fault in him, he would not be in the perfect sacrifice. Right. He had to be someone with no fault. And they found no fault in their examination. They could not name one single thing in his life he had done wrong. It was all lies. It was all worked up. It was a mob mentality yep. going on there. Yeah, uh-huh. <laughs> now, Pilate was more interested in pleasing the mob. He was in the seeking truth. Verse 12, And Pilate answered and said unto them, again unto them, What will you then that I shall do unto you, whom you call the king of the Jews? And they cried out again, Crucify him. Then Pilate said unto them, Why, what evil hath he done? And they cried out the more exceedingly, Crucify him. So Pilate went and content the people, released Barabbas unto them, and delivered Jesus, whom when he had scourged him, or severe beaten, uh, to be crucified. Now he was beaten, what is called the cat of nine tails. It had it had a it had a like a little rod, a little rod going up, and uh, a little handle type, and then he had nine different tails to it, and on each tail they'd have something that would cut people, stones or glass or whatever, some small nails, but on the H9 pieces, they were in, uh, sharp pieces on the, on the, on the strips here. So you, when you hit somebody, they would actually dig in to the flesh, and you pull that thing back, they'd pull flesh out, mm -hmm. like fish hooks, cat of nine tails. Mm -hmm. Now they would beat someone, the law says 40 times, but you'd always find 39 times. Because they want to be safe, they didn't go 41. Mm -hmm. They were so concerned about the law. You find them beating them 39 times. Matter of fact, they beat Paul, it says 40 times minus one. Same thing with him, to make sure they didn't break the law. They were concerned about the law, but they missed the Messiah. Because the law, the letter killeth, but the Spirit maketh alive. Now, for the album, <clears throat> you read please Psalm 22, verse 14 through 19. <clears throat> I am, <clears throat> excuse me, I am poured out like water, and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax, it is melted in the midst of my bowels. My strength is dried up like a potsherd, and my tongue cleaveth to my jaws, and thou hast brought me into the dust of death. For dogs have compassed me, the assembly of the wicked have enclosed me. They pierce my hands and my feet. I may tell all my bones, <clears throat> they look and stare upon me. They part out my garments among them and cast lots upon my vesture. But be not thou far from me, O Lord, O my strength, haste thee to help me. We can't, we can't comprehend it, can we? All my bones, he can see all his bones just staring at him. We can't comprehend what he went through for us, for the whole world. Brother Dave, do you know what a pot shirt is? It's a broken piece, a pottery. Uh, what, what do you find? What do you find there? It's in, I don't have a, I was curious what it was. I think it's, I think it's broken pottery or broken pieces because mm -hmm. that's what uh, Joe scraped himself with. Good thing. He scraped himself with something like that. And his body, he was so full of uh, pain and agony. I think it's a, anybody got your Bible? I think written? that's what it is. is. Broken mm -hmm. piece of pottery? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. This is a broken piece of an earthen vessel. Earthen vessel. Mm -hmm. Thank you. He described himself like a broken piece 
of a, a vessel. And Psalm 22 is a good song to read. I mean, it'd break your heart, but that's what he went through with. Jesus endured the cruelest of punishments that he did not that he did not deserve. Let's go back to verse 16 now. And the soldiers led him away into the hall called, how y'all pronounce that? Praetorium. Okay, now what it is, it's used to, it's used for higher ranking Roman officers. That's the hall they used. For the higher ranking Roman officials, they would use that hall. Now the hall here is one of the courtyards, which is called what you just said it's called. And they and they called together the whole band. Now the band here is spelled C-O-H-R-T in Greek. It's a military unit of 400, 600 men. So now to this special place, this hall, they brought in now is between 400 and 600 men involved in this eight, uh, this morning of trial and what he's going through with. Verse 17, and they clothed him with purple, that represents royal, uh, royalty, and planted a, a crown of thorns and put it on his head. You know, kings wore crowns and they making fun of him because they say he's a king. Then verse 18, and began to salute him, hail king of the Jews. They still mocking him. Verse 19, and they smoke him on the head with a reed and the reed here is a heavy bamboo, like a cane. Hit him on the head with a cane. And did spit upon him. More than one time. They spitting on him. And bowed their knees in mockery, worshipped him. When they had mocked him, they took off the purple from him and put his own clothes on him and laid him out to crucify him. So he not only with the pain we just heard from Psalms about what he's going through with, now they're just making a mockery of it. Putting all this stuff on him, spitting on him, hitting him with a, a cane. And uh, one place in the Bible said they, they slapped him. They slapped him. So all this has been done by the one who could have stopped. He could have said one word, they could all fell back. Mm -hmm. Because they did outside the garden of Gethsemane. He walked out and faced that mob, and they all fell back like dead people. But it was God's will that he'd go through all this for us, for people. Now, any more you want to add to the first part before the crucifixion? Well, Dean, was the crown of thorns common for crucifixion, or was it just for Jesus? I don't really know. Because that's his crown. That's his. Yeah. I think it was. Because he was a king. I don't yeah. think I don't think it was a not common thing. I, I personally don't think it's a common think thing. So. I think they did that as a part of the mocking of him right. being mm -hmm. the, the See, they would put across the top of the cross too right. what you're guilty of. And they put on his cross. What was the king of the Jews? Mm -hmm. the king of the Jews. That's what they had on his title. Mm -hmm. Others would have robbery or murder or whatever above their crosses. And they put above him. Well they couldn't. The, 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 there wasn't nothing that he was accused uh -huh. of. I mean, there was nothing that they could put on there. So they just put something on there and said, hey, you say you're the king of the Jews. So I said, well, no problem. And when he, went, when he faced Herod, see, Pilate sent him to Herod, and he called Herod an old fox. <laughs> he called him an old fox. He's the one he called an old fox. So Herod sent him back to Pilate. So he went to religious people first, ended up at Pilate. Pilate sent him to Herod. Herod sent him back to, we sent him back to Pilate. So you know, he brother, faced, I'm brother sorry. Brother Dean, I kind of feel like they were doing this to, to punish Jesus. But I feel like in God's mind, that was a victor's crown. Oh, yeah. The crown. Yeah. And they, they was, Christ was dying for them also. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The ones that was killing him. Mm -hmm. That's the reason he said they didn't know what they were doing. So on the, on the cross was the first thing he said. Mm -hmm. Father, Father, forgive him. They what they do. The first thing he said. The second part we want to call is defense, defense during the crucifixion. We have two things. Number one, Jesus arrived at Golgotha in verse 21. And they compelled one Simon, a Cyrenian, who passed by. Now he passed by because it's God's will he passed by. I believe that. Coming out of the country, the father of Alexandra and Rufus, to bear his cross. So they got him 
to bear his cross. Probably most theologians believe what he carried was not a whole thing, but the cross man, the one that peeled on top. They think that's what he carried. Because some of the crossings were made like this. That was one design. And of course, some were made like this. But either way, they believe that the cross beam is probably what Simon carried, this piece right across here. Probably already, they probably already had this piece of peeled on the mountain already because they crucified people all the time. But anyway, he carries, he carries it uh, for him because really, He's broken down so much by now, been beaten like he has. He doesn't have physical strength to do this. Look in verse 22. And they brought him into the place Golgotha. Now, the Aramaic name is, oh, uh, this, is, this is the Aramaic name, Golgotha, which is being interpreted the place of a skull because it actually looked like a skull. You've seen before clouds that you can identify things up like, you know, or even we have heels sometimes. Did you see kind of pictures of it? So if you looked at Golgotha, it looked like a place of a skull, like a skull of man's, of man's head. And they gave him to drink wine mingled with myrrh because this also was common to give some of the ones being crucified because this would actually kind of mild the pain of what they're going through. But he refused it. He refused it. He received it not. He wouldn't take it. So look at verse number, uh, uh, well, we'll start right there. So he arrives at Golgotha. He's offered a drink that he will not receive. And then look at the time of the morning sacrifice. Let's go to verse 24. When they crucified him, they parted his garments, cast lots upon them, what every man should take. And it was a third hour or 9 a.m., he went to the cross at 9 a.m. and they crucified him. At 9 a.m. was the morning sacrifice. And at 3 p.m. in the afternoon when he died, there was the evening sacrifice. So he began that day on the cross for the morning sacrifice. And when he died six hours later, it was time for the evening sacrifice. And he says, the Bible says, he is one sacrifice for all sin, for all, all men. Himself, he is a sacrifice today that we have. We don't do 9 a.m. and 3, 3 p.m. sacrifices mm -hmm. because his sacrifice is sufficient for us today. Amen. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, Miss Rosemary, will you please read Psalm 22, 17, and 18? I may tell all my bones they look and stare upon me. They part my garments among them and cast lots upon my vesture. See, the Psalms was the Old Testament hymn book. It's amazing. We have just read what she read from Psalm. And a little while ago, we had somebody, oh, Brother, Brother Alton, read from Psalm. And from the, from the Old Testament hymn book, we see in these prophecies mm -hmm. pop up in these songs. Mm -hmm. What's going to take place? And it took place exactly like the songs mm -hmm. are recorded. There was a lot said in those songs about what was coming, his crucifixion. <clears throat> Anything you want to add to the second part? Okay, the last one is the events following the crucifixion. We have two things here. Number one, the veil is torn from top to bottom. Now we know what the veil is. We know what it represents, brother, in the Old Testament when it comes to the synagogue they had and then to the temple because you had it was the same dimensions for this place. I'm gonna draw it this way. <coughs> it was the same dimensions, but anyway, it was a veil here. This was a holy place, and they used that place every day for sacrifices. You had in there the table of shit bread, you had the candlestick, uh, and, that, and you had a brazen, brazen altar they could wash when they needed to for sacrifices. That's the holy place, and it was used every day. But this is the Holy of Holies. It was used one time a year by the high priest. And he couldn't go back there until, until uh, he got himself clean, changed garments, washed himself, and then once a year he could go through that veil. They have a rope tied to him 
in case he died back there, to put him out. Because anybody else went back there, they'd have died too. And this only happened once a year on the, uh, on the Day of Atonement. I forgot what day it was. Is it October or something? Anyway, it's in the fall of the year for us. So now this is the veil we're talking about right here. This is the veil. So look at it again, please, with me in verse number 38. And the veil of the temple was rent in twain, or two paces, from top to bottom. Now, why is, why is it necessary to say it's from top to bottom? Why do you think it's... Because I believe it was because God, God tore it. If it had been man tearing it, it would have been from the bottom up because God was on top. And that's, that's, the, same, that's the same God that knocked, knocked down Goliath. Right. And he fell. When, he, when the stone hit Goliath's forehead, the Bible says he fell forward. That's right. You think, well, he got hit in the forehead, he fall back. Mm -hmm. But God knocked him down, really. And God knocked, knocked down the walls of Jericho. God done it. Going around the wall, they knock it down. God knocked it down. So here, Brother Todd, I think you're 100% right. God done it. it. The veil was rent from top to bottom. Somebody had to, had to rent it. So we're looking at here that it was God. And why did he rent it? So now, it's a picture that we can get in now. Who said we can come now? In other and, words, to say it is finished? Yeah. You don't have to wait to one time a year. You don't have to have somebody that's going back there. We can, we can, we can go down here 24 hours a day. Mm -hmm. Anybody can go. Yeah. Yeah. Anybody. Who said we yeah. can come now? Mm -hmm. That's wonderful. Yes. Then we don't have to get somebody else to go back here for us. Mm -hmm. When you pray this morning, you were in the Holy of Holies this morning. Mm -hmm. You had the privilege today, your prayers this morning, and you're having this afternoon, tonight, whatever. Keep on going in there. Because we also got called, and Peter, we're called a royal priesthood. A holy nation. Isn't that something? Yes. So, Matthew provided a more clear table of this. Let's read what Matthew says, please. We'll turn to Matthew 27, and we'll read how Holy Spirit inspired him to talk about this. Matthew 27, and we'll begin in verse number 51. Okay, Matthew 27, verse 51. And behold, the veil of the temple was rent in twain from the top to the bottom, and the earth did quake, and the rocks rent. And we're going to find out right here, class, now, when did this happen? When was it rent? We're going to find out, Matthew, when it was rent, okay? And the graves were open, and many bodies of the saints which slept arose. And, it came, and they came out of the graves after his resurrection. See the words now? It's very important after his resurrection, and went into the holy city, Jerusalem, and appeared unto many. Now when the centurion and they that were with him watching Jesus saw the earthquake and those things that were, that were done, they feared greatly, saying, truly, this was the Son of God. And many women, well, that's far more good. So after the resurrection is when this took place, when it was rent from top to bottom. Some say it happened Immediately. But according to Matthew, this all took place after the resurrection. So let's look at one more place. Hebrews 10. Go to your right over to Hebrews 10, just before James. Let's read what God says there. Hebrews 10 and verse number 19. Hebrews 10, 19, having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiness by the blood of Jesus, by the blood of Jesus. See now, we can go back there and I place now holiness. Why? Because by the blood of Jesus. We go back there by the blood of Jesus. Now what they've done up here before the high priest, he had to have a sacrifice here. He had sprinkled blood on the, on the altar. Before he go back there, it was still blood that made him prepare to go back there. But now it says here, by a new and living way, not a dead animal now, because Christ has been resurrected, which he had consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say his flesh. See, that's how it describes the veil now is his flesh. 
we go we can go through him now. We can go through him now. So in verse, let's read verse 21. And have the high priest over the house of God, which he's our high priest today. Look at verse 22. Let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith. Have not hearts sprinkled from evil conscience, and our bodies washed with pure water. All that's pointing back to the holy place out here, see? Being washed and all of that. And we wash the pure water today by the word of God, see? We're washed by the word of God. Down like verse 23 too. Let us hold fast profession of our faith without wavering. For he's faithful to promise. We hold fast what's being said because he's faithful to promise us. We are promised now through his flesh, through him, we have the right to go to the Holy of the Holies in our life and pray and worship God. Anything now you want to add to the lesson today? Any more discussion or comments? Please, for, okay? A couple of things I learned when I went to Israel. I've got a picture of Golgotha. And, and the reason it looks like a skull is because of, of uh, caves. There's two caves high up in the mountain, oh. one in the middle, and a large gashing cave oh. at the bottom. Is it? And it makes it look like a, a skull. Uh -huh. and, and those cult uh, caves look like sunken, oh, well, sunken eye sockets. Mm -hmm. uh, and another thing I learned was my whole life, <clears throat> When I've seen Christ on the cross in pictures, he's been on top of the hill. But he wasn't on top of Golgotha, he was at the base of Golgotha. Mm -hmm. And the reason for that was the uh, Romans crucified people along the major thoroughfares, mm -hmm. the, the busiest roads in the area so that more people would see to deter. And to deter them from doing anything bad. Mm -hmm. And Golgotha is right across the, the road from Jerusalem and the road that goes from Cairo to Damascus. It's the Damascus Road. Mm -hmm. And uh, so he was taken out of the city right across the, the major thoroughfare and crucified at the base of Golgotha. Mm -hmm. Uh, those were some of the things that I didn't realize because of the way that uh, it's been depicted to me mm -hmm. my whole life. Yeah, that, that's good. So Thank you for sharing that. Mm -hmm. So it looks like a face, like a face. Yeah, I got a picture of it. I'll bring you a picture. Okay, I'll show, see it. Mm -hmm. I'll show you the picture of it. Anything else? thing I've realized today is the luckiest man that ever lived probably was the was the other criminal that was hanging with him who received his forgiveness <clears throat> and his mm -hmm. lack of sin and he is going with him with Jesus to paradise. Same day, yeah. The luckiest he, man in the world. Yeah, he was he was uh, he was headed for hell. And the other one could have been saved too. Yeah. If he had just turned to him. But he warned him. He didn't want a cross. Get us down from here. Save yourself and save us. He didn't want the cross. The other thing, just wanted, he wanted paradise. Mm -hmm. And he got paradise. Mm -hmm. Let's see. That, Go ahead. Him saying that made me think of want to be left, want to be taken. Yeah. yeah. See, so paradise, back in those days, you had a gulf between the two. We had the story of the Bible about the rich man won't drink the water from Lazarus. He said, there's a gulf between us. So paradise, you had down beneath the earth. That's where Christ went beneath. You had paradise down there. And then you had over here, you had hell. So when Christ went, descended three days and three nights down here, he brought, he set the cat to free. He brought these people out, and then many graves were opened in Jerusalem, and they walked around after they raised from the dead. So paradise, he came to paradise, he went preached to them, brought them out, and now they're in the third heaven. So paradise is a word, I forgot what it means, a beautiful place or something like that. 
We can still use the name paradise today. It's a wonderful place, but we're not going beneath the earth. Paradise, we're going down to the third heaven to be in God's presence. But that's what happened when people get raised up. It said he led captivity as captive and set men free, set people free on his ascension back into, back into heaven. Any more comments? Brother Dane, if, if it, was, it was prophesied how he was going to die and the thing that was going to happen, why didn't the Pharaohs and the ones that had him crucified, why, why didn't they change, try to change the way all this took, all this took place? That's some good thoughts, isn't it? Well, like, they, like, they, they did. They tried to. But couldn't. Okay. They they put they put soldiers in front of the tomb mm -hmm. for one thing to try to, to try to make sure that the body didn't disappear. Uh, but also they weren't they weren't educated on the Old Testament. Right, that's what I was gonna say. They don't they didn't know all of these prophecies. Mm -hmm. If they had, they probably would have tried harder. I think the same thing for the Lord, but with the disciples. They didn't believe it either. Mm -hmm. They ain't gonna be resurrected. They they didn't. They all run. They didn't believe it. He spent three and a half years with them. He taught them about resurrection, but they didn't receive it. You know? yeah, they mocked him like they did. You would think by mocking him, they would if they had knew that, they would have tried to change some of this stuff. I forgot what said, but Bible, if the prince of this world had known, they would not have crucified the Lord of Glory. I forgot what said. Maybe in Galatians. It's talking about leadership, princes. If they had known, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. If they had known the outcome. They thought all the time they, they were winning. You know, they, they thought they were going to win. We're going to win this thing. Get him out of the way. You know, He caused enough trouble already. And he had. You think about what trouble he caused with his uh, ministry. Multitudes going to him and not to the old authority. Yeah, yeah. Jealous. Yes. Jealous, yeah. But even Pilate's wife, was it Pilate's wife that had a dream? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Even she warned him. Yeah. Don't have a thing to do with this man. So he washed his hands, didn't he? Mm -hmm. 